Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. Throughout this book, we've been talking about locality constraints. The idea that certain things must be near one another in order for the sentence to be licensed or, or judged grammatical. So, For example, we talked about with theta roles that the theta role has to be assigned to an item within the phrase uh, that, from the, that is headed by the theta role uh, assigner. So, for example, a theme theta role must be assigned within the verb phrase that uh, assigned that has the verb that takes the theme theta role. Another example is condition A of the binding theory, which says that um, anaphores must be within the same clause as their, um, as their binder. Uh, yet another example we've talked about is feature checking, where we've motivated movement by claiming that things move to positions where they're near their, their, uh, their checkers. So for example, uh, the a nominative DP is going to move into the specifier of a finite TP because that's the place it can check its nominative case. All of this research on locality stems from a very influential dissertation that was written in the late 1960s by the linguist Hash Ross. He discovered a phenomenon called islands, and islands are effectively um, restrictions on how far you can do WH movement. Let's look at some examples. So let's start off with these two structures, which mean essentially the same thing. Sydney claimed that she read the book, and Sydney made the claim that she read the book. Those are effectively um, uh, saying exactly the same thing. Now, in the first sentence, we have the verb claim. And in the second sentence, we have the verb made, and we have a noun phrase, the claim, that has a relative clause on it that modifies it. Now, uh, just looking at these two sentences, there isn't much difference. But once we start doing WH movement, things get very interesting. So um, let's take the, uh, the sentence with the verbal claim. And what we find is that, in fact, we can do movement of an element from within the embedded clause that moves up to the beginning of the main clause. So what did Bill claim that he read? The what starts off as the object of read, and that's perfectly grammatical. But when we uh, switch this to the other construction where we're making the claim and uh, this embedded clause is no longer the complement of the verb, but is a relative clause on the noun, the claim, things get quite different. This sentence becomes utterly ungrammatical. What did Bill make the claim that he read is uh, not even remotely as grammatical as what did Bill claim that he read. So what's the difference here? The difference seems to be that you can do WH movement out of a, a clause when it is the complement of a verb, but you can't do WH movement out of a clause when it is the complement of a noun. This is our first instance of a, uh, what we call an island. The island here is the DP. So DPs are structures you can't get out of by doing WH movement. The, the name island comes from the idea that when you're on an island, you're surrounded by water and you can't get off of them or out of them. So WH movement can't get out of an island. So DPs are like a tropical island. Um, no WH movement can get outside of this structure. You can do WH movement within the structure, but not out of the structure. By contrast, in this first sentence, there's this CP is not embedded inside of a DP, so you can do WH movement, and that's grammatical. That's a DP island. Um, we actually can state this as a, as a constraint on the grammar. 
we uh, sometimes called the complex DP constraint or sometimes the complex NP constraint, which effectively says if you have um, a WH movement and it crosses over a DP bracket, so this movement has crossed over a DP bracket, then the sentence is going to be ungrammatical. There are some tricky cases, but that's the basic generalization. Another example, this one a little more complicated, comes from what we call WH islands. WH islands are the situations where you have two WH phrases, and you're trying to move one around another WH element. So let's take the sentence, I wonder um, what John bought with the $20 bill. Here we have a case where the what element is moved from an object position of bought. It's moved into the specifier of that embedded CP. So here we have an embedded clause and what moves, uh, gets its case and its theta roll down here and it moves to the spec of this CP. That is grammatical. Notice that it's also grammatical to move um, a, um, a WH word that's associated with this adjunct position, which would probably be an, uh, an adverb phrase. So um, we can replace with the $20 bill with how, and when we do that, we can do movement. In this case, we're moving um, the how all the way to the beginning of the main clause. So this one is moving to the specifier of the embedded clause, and this one is moving to the specifier of the main clause. So these two movements are both legitimate movements. Um, they're legitimate on their own. But the minute you try to do both of these movements, so move the what into the specifier of the embedded clause, and move the how into the specifier of the main clause, the sentence becomes completely ungrammatical. How do you wonder what John bought is ungrammatical um, with these two movements where you've moved the what from the object position and the how from uh, this adjunct position. I will say, um, for those of you who are saying that's not ungrammatical, um, it's not ungrammatical when the how is modifying wonder. So uh, if you ask the question, how do you wonder what John bought, you might answer something like, with my brain, or um, uh, because I'm always curious, or something like that, uh, where the how is modifying the wonder. But the relevant interpretation uh, that's ungrammatical is the one where how modifies by, not wonder. So this asterisk refers to that interpretation where the how is, in, is modifying by. So if you find this grammatical, that's just um, an illusion. You're hearing the how is a modifier of wonder. If you force the interpretation where how is modifying by, it's not okay. So that's a WH island. Let's do another example. Um, this, this one, uh, for those of you uh, who, who were sort of on the fence about the previous example, this one should be completely ungrammatical for most of you. Um, by the way, I am alternating between wonder and think. Um, that's okay. Uh, wonder and think mean roughly the same thing. They only differ in uh, whether or not they take a WH complement or a, uh, a complement without a WH phrase. So uh, this wonder takes plus WH and think takes minus WH. That's why I'm alternating between the two to construct the sentences. Now, if you look at this first sentence, what we've said is, I wonder what John kissed. So imagine John kissed the gorilla. I wonder what John kissed. The, um, the what uh, refers to the theme of kissed, and it gets accusative case down here, and it moves to the specifier of this embedded clause um, uh, in order to put it in this position in front of the subject. Um, that's licensed by virtue of the fact that this CP is plus WH as required by wonder. Um, we can also do movement of the John in John Kiss the Gorilla. So we can turn John into a, a, a WH word, and uh, we can move it up to the beginning of the main clause. We can also move it up to the uh, beginning of the embedded clause, but I'm interested in the case where we move it to the... Um, 
the matrix WH position. Um, here's the did, and that's occupying the C position, so we know it's moving all the way up here. Um, so both of these movements are licit. So moving the object into the specifier of the embedded CP is fine. Missing the, moving the subject into the specifier of the main clause um, CP is fine. But once again, what we find is that if you try to do both of these movements, what, you ha what, results in, what it results in is an ungrammatical sentence. So if we move the what word into the embedded clause like the first sentence, and we move the who word into the um, CP of the higher clause as in the second sentence, the sen the, what you get is who do you wonder what kissed, which is a very strange uh, sentence indeed. Uh, what these, this example and the previous slides example showed you was that you cannot do WH movement out of a CP that has another WH element in its specifier. So what's critically at stake here is our WH word that's in the specifier of this embedded clause seems to be blocking the movement of this other WH element up into the higher clause. This is a WH island. It's a WH island because the island is created by this embedded WH element. The constraint we have that explains WH islands is called the WH island constraint. And what it says in words is a CP with the WH phrase in it specifier is an island for the movement of other WH phrases. So in the more formal terms, here we have a CP that has a WH element in its specifier, and it blocks movement of other WH elements around it. That's a WH island. WH islands are going to be important for us. They're the ones we're going to have the easiest time explaining. So we're going to come back to WH islands again. Now, there are many other kinds of islands that Ross identified. He identified one called the subject condition. And the subject condition says that if you have a CP in the subject position of a clause, you can't do WH movement out of that. So take the sentence that the police would arrest several rioters was a certainty. The CP that the police would arrest several rioters sits in the subject position of the clause was a certainty. You cannot do WH movement out of that CP that's in subject position. So you can't say, who was that the police would arrest was a certainty. It's just terrible. That's where we've done uh, movement of who out of that position. This is stated as the subject condition. It's uh, restated just here in terms of abstract categories and brackets. If you have a CP that's in the specifier of a TP, then it follows that uh, there's no movement out of that position. Another constraint is the coordinate structure constraint. Now, this one gets really quite complicated, but the intuition of it is that you can't move um, either, uh, you can't WH move either conjunct of a conjoined phrase, and you can't move out of either conjunct in a conjoined phrase. So take the sentence, I liked Mary and John. You can't question John. You can't say, who did you like Mary and? Nor can you question Mary. Who did you like and John? So that's completely ungrammatical uh, because we're trying to question a, uh, one of the conjuncts and not the other. You can, of course, um, do WH uh, movement of both elements, right? So you can WH move um, the whole conjunction. You also can't extract out of a conjunction. So here we have two conjoined verb phrases, um, ate some popcorn, and drank some soda. I ate some popcorn and drank some soda. I cannot um, do WH movement out of one, but not the other um, conjunct. So I can't say, what did you eat some popcorn and drink? Where drink, uh, the what, is referring back to some soda. 
And similarly, I can't extract out uh, a WH word associated with some popcorn. What did you eat and drink some soda? It's, uh, these are ungrammatical as well. Now, the WH island constraint uh, is quite complicated when you write it out in terms of variable categories. Uh, it looks like this, and, and that's a bit of a horror show. Uh, and whenever you see a constraint like this, you have to ask yourself, something's gone wrong, because we should be able to state this in a more succinct way. But for our purposes, this will get at the basic facts. Uh, WH movement can't um, take either of the conjuncts or can't extract from within either of the conjuncts. So those are islands. Islands are elements that you cannot do WH movement out of.